today we are incredibly excited to welcome uh, Professor Christine Bell, whose talk is entitled Peace Processes and Inclusion, The Challenge for Women. Uh, Christine Bell is Professor of Constitutional Law and Assistant Principal of Global Justice at the University of Edinburgh. Her research interests lie in the interface between constitutional and international law, gender and conflict, and legal theory, with a particular interest in peace processes and their agreements. She is the executive director and principal investigator of the Peace and Conflict Resolution Platform, which is an 18.5 million pound five-year program, uh, which researches how peace processes can be reinvented to respond to changing conflict dynamics. Through the program, Professor Bell and the University of Edinburgh Peace Rep team uh, work on incubating peace tech solutions to conflict with a particular focus on data. Uh, Professor Bell and her colleagues at the University of Edinburgh are also responsible for the creation of PAX uh, Agreement Database, which is a unique archive and a qualitative and quantitative resource comprising all the world's peace agreements from 1990 to date. I can personally confirm how detailed uh, this database is. And so thank you, uh, Professor Bell, for your contribution. And I encourage others uh, to check it out. Our speaker will present for 50 minutes, uh, and then we'll have 25 minutes for questions from our audience. We ask that you hold your questions until the end of the talk. Uh, because of today's Zoom format, we ask that you raise your virtual hand or type your question into the chat. Hannah Riley Bowles will be managing the online Q&A, uh, and we do ask that any audience questions be very brief, be on topic, and most importantly, be posed in the form of a question related to Professor Bell's research. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. We're delighted to see so many familiar and new names in the audience. Uh, and with that, please welcome Professor Christine Bell. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to uh, say thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to speak to the WAP tonight and uh, to meet with all of you and have a chance to exchange with you at the end. Uh, I'm just going to share some slides and begin from there. Mm. So. I'm actually originally from Northern Ireland. I was born and bred in Belfast, and I'm one of the generation that grew up in conflict. Uh, the conflict began more or less around the time I was born and continued until the peace agreement in 1998 when I was a young adult. Uh, the conflict ostensibly revolved around a constitutional dispute as to whether Northern Ireland would be part of Ireland or part of the United Kingdom. The island had been partitioned in 1920, um, leaving a largely Protestant majority in the north and a Catholic majority in the south. That triggered a civil war in the south, which was res resolved. Um, but conflict continued in the north um, and erupted really in the late 1960s uh, over demands for uh, equal citizenship for Catholics in the north who comprised about 40% of the population at that time. Uh, and the demands were for equality in voting, equality in housing, and equality in jobs, because all these things were very unequal. Uh, the, um, it was, the conflict was really what academics would now call a low-intensity um, conflict. It was never really acknowledged to be a conflict by the United Kingdom government. Um, and for most of my childhood and adult life, I really experienced the conflict as normal. I didn't really realize it wasn't normal, although I had a sense that something was badly wrong. In fact, I remember learning about the conflict from being advertised at by the UK government. Um, when I was very young, there was a set of adverts before Christmas that's had a, that were like graffiti on a brick wall. I mean, these were billboards, and they said, seven years is enough, dot, dot, dot. And then in the new year, the second phase of the, of the campaign came, which said, dot, 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 don't make it eight. But it was actually to be 30 years before the conflict ended. Uh, my own personal journey involved working as a teenager in what really would have been peace movements. Um, I've put here the... the uh, <laughs> The, the famous blackboard from Derry Girls, if any of you don't know what that is, it's a comedy programme 
and I was later to live in Derry. And in fact, that's the part of the world my family's from. Um, and I, I went on a lot of events that involved Catholic and Protestant young people being brought together, often to do everything except talk about ourselves and the con and the conflict. We would go to plant trees and things like that. Um, and I suppose then, as I went away from Northern Ireland and trained as a lawyer and realised it wasn't very normal, I came back and I really didn't see these sorts of things as a solution. It's really important that people do get on. But in the end of the day, it wasn't us that were holding guns. It wasn't us that were fighting. Um, and it seemed to me that while we could get on, when we went back to our own neighbourhoods and our own houses, our experience of life was really different. And it was really different around things like our experience of policing, um, our experience of socioeconomic equality. Um, our schools were different. So it was very hard to sustain relationships. And the reasons for those were structural and not interpersonal. So I became involved in human rights work um, that um, took me to sort of be the chairperson of the, uh, the main sort of human rights group. We were a group very like the ACLU, but working on all the issues in the conflict. And that was work I continued into the peace process. And I became involved in two things, really. Human rights work was always a commitment and also supporting women to be engaged in politics at that time through a program called Women Into Politics that supported women to both be involved in their own political parties and to try to set up a political party of their own, which of course they did famously in the Women's Coalition. And that work of mine continued, I suppose, during the peace process. During that time, um, when the peace process began, we didn't know too much about peace processes. Um, and so I started looking as an academic at other peace processes and collecting agreements. Some of this was before the internet. So actually, I would often write to armed groups and governments who were surprisingly willing to post back <laughs> their peace agreements that they were quite proud of. Uh, and as I know now, really, from the end of the Cold War in about 1990, um, a, the practice really had emerged, partly because post-Cold War, a lot of conflict had erupted, um, and partly because um, there were also there was a new international will and consensus to try to get engaged in helping to solve conflict that arose largely within state borders. Um, I like to use this slide, and um, as you can see, for um, quite often I ask my students which uh, Sesame Street question, which one of these ones is not like the other ones, and the answer is often um, the picture to. Um, the bottom right as you're looking at it, it's the only picture that has um, a woman in it. Um, but this gives you an example of some of the conflicts that were resolved over the years, moving from the top left clockwise. There's the, um, the Arusha Accords being signed in Rwanda in 1993, the Oslo Accords being signed between Itzhak Rabin and Arafat in 1993, um, the uh, the Bosnia and Dayton Agreement signed, interestingly, Milosevic at the table, who was later to be indicted in the criminal court. Um, the, the middle row to the left is the Chittagong Hills Tract Accord, signed between the Bangladesh government and the United People's Party of Chittagong. In the middle, we have the, the Belfast Accords of 19, the Belfast Agreement of 1998, um, Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern signing. Um, the Bougainville Accord, it's a small island in Papua New Guinea, but a hidden conflict where reputedly around 20,000 people were killed in 10 years, a quarter of the island's population, signed in 2001. Sudan, Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005, which was ultimately to lead to the secession of um, southern Sudan in 2011. The Republic of Burundi um, and the FNL signing agreements in 2006, and the government of the Philippines um, and uh, Miriam Coronel signing in the, for the government of the Philippines in the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, um, where women were notably present as mediators, particularly on the government side. And what did these? Why did this sort of all happen? It was part of, I suppose, a move that was a bit different from what had happened prior to the Cold War. Um, where agreements were signed that had several features that were somewhat new. First of all, 
They involved negotiations that were often face to face or through shuttle diplomacy directly with the state, their opponents, and involvement of international actors. And this was fairly new at that time. Often past tactics had involved trying to work with moderates to marginalised armed groups or in agreements that weren't internationalised. Secondly, um, often the modality of getting to agreement was to reach a formal signed peace agreement. And these agreements um, coupled two things. Firstly, a commitment by armed groups and often the state to go on ceasefire, um, but also to agree to new structures, a new constitutional roadmap or set of commitments to new institutions. Um, and fourthly, a big difference from the time before the Cold War was really that human rights and humanitarian law were understood to, in some sense, apply and constrain both the negotiations and what could be negotiated. So this led to a sort of era of peace processes, and it's an era that we now document through using some of those documents that I collected from the early stage. I kept on collecting peace agreements and um, uh, trying to understand this practice as it evolved over the years since. The challenges, of course, of this style of reaching agreement are several, um, and they're ones that particularly implicate women, women's agenda and where it's involved. But in fact, they implicate a lot of civic actors, actors that have always committed to civic behaviour rather than armed violence. So each of these has a corollary challenge. First of all, having the face-to-face -face negotiations between the violent actors put the violent actors often at the heart of the new political settlement. Agreements meant compromise and compromises have to continue to be worked out. They're not just reached in one moment. Uh, coupling ceasefires with a longer term reconstitutive vision often creates a clash between short term goals of reaching a ceasefire, for example, where you might want to give certain armed actors amnesties and longer term goals um, of reconstituting a society where you might want to have a commitment to the rule of law. And negotiating in a framework that assumes human rights and humanitarian law to apply creates a certain dilemma between what are the commitments of justice and what are the pragmatic commitments of peace. And in fact, a justice peace debate has often been key both within societies and at the level of academics and practitioners. Uh, so in terms of how do we sort of see these tensions? What I'm going to suggest to you is that it's a tension between different forms of inclusion. Firstly, inclusion of the people, ideologies, identities and interests that lie at the heart of the conflict and generate the conflict. And secondly, the broader civic inclusion of social movements and agendas for change, many of which are bound up with the conflict uh, in different ways. Um, a lot of these conflicts have had um, a level have revolved around social justice claims um, as much as political claims. Since the time, uh, since 1990 onwards, um, I've just given the figures, sorry, this, it should say up until date, not to 2016, but as of today, there's over 2,000 peace and transition agreements in over 150 peace processes. Now, there's around 200 countries in the world, so that tells you that many countries have multiple peace processes within them. All the data I'm referring to can be found on our peace agreement website. So you can see that this is a really huge scale, majority world um, phenomenon. And why are there so many peace agreements? Well, partly it's how we've collected them. So we've collected peace agreements right across from a pre negotiation and ceasefire stage right through to implementation stage, because one of the things we found was there's never just one moment for peace. This is really a way of comparing peace processes that often last for many years. And I've just given you a sort of indication of the breakdown here of the agreements. So we've classified agreements as ceasefire agreements that try to get the parties to ceasefire, pre-negotiations that are about how parties get to talks, what they're negotiating about, what are the conditions of safety, etc. Um, 
what we've called partial agreements, where they reach agreement on some issues but not all, and substantive agreements, where they try to come to some sort of comprehensive ending of the conflict. And then what you find is there's often agreements needed to implement those agreements over many years that substantially modify them. Um, this little category of renewal agreements at the top is just a funny little category. There's some agreements where just a ceasefire has broken down and people literally reiterate the agreement they've just said and renew it in some sense, often using exactly the same text. Uh, so that gives you a sense um, of overall and I suppose it also gives you a sense of where the weight of negotiation happens. So it takes you know, just as long to get into talks and to many, many agreements to get into talks as it does to actually resolve the conflict. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out that in many ways this has been a successful practice and a bit of an unsung, um, an, an unsung success story. Um, there's a lot of debate over the figures. But both the Global Peace Index and, and the other deaths and conflict data show really a steady downward decline of deaths and conflict from 1990, from the early days of 1990 onwards, as this practice grew, uh, until 2014, when deaths in Syria alone started to reverse the trend. And from then on, the trend is reversed, but also so has the amount of agreements and negotiations dropped. Um, so it's a practice that has been a valuable one. Um, conflict is now on the rise again. But while these agreements reduced deaths and conflict, they were much less good at producing positive peace in the sense of a self-renewing political order that delivers social justice, good government, etc. Now, where have women been in these conflicts? Uh, and where have they been in the peace process? Well, like many forms um, of military violence, women have been underrepresented as, as um, in the armed groups and in governments perpetuating violence and overrepresented in civic groups uh, and local groups working on the ground. Uh, and women have often um, sought access to negotiations and been in negotiations, um, but to much less extent. Uh, they've been in negotiations to a much lesser extent. So it's very hard to produce figures on how many signatories uh, of, agree of agreements are women, but it's just a marginal percent, less than 10%. Um, and women have therefore had to engage in a whole range of strategies for trying to get access to talks. Um, I've just listed some of them here, but often actually protest, straightforward protest has been a really um, important role of women in trying to end conflict and also in trying to gain access to talks. Women often have worked by building what we call in our project civicness as a practice. So working to um, try to reduce conflict by bringing together coalitions of people to address early onset of conflict. Uh, by building relationships across women, this was really strong in Northern Ireland. Um, where one of the organisations I worked for had actually grown out of the reality that there had been a sectarian decision to pull all funding from um, Catholic women groups. And so both the Catholic and the Protestant women groups came together into a network to fight that decision. And that would be a good example of civicness in action, something that demonstrates the capacity for peace, um, even while the conflict's ongoing. Women have also, of course, joined political parties. But in many societies with hyper-masculinized violence, um, that has been a more difficult role for them. And also, women have sought to influence agendas from beyond the talks or through civil society inclusion in the talks. And sometimes people talk about track one, the diplomatic level, and track two, civil society talks, and sometimes even track three, community talks. So women have been very influential in track two and track three talks in particular. But still, what has been achieved in agreements is relatively little for women. I just put in the data up. So one of the things that we did in the programme was we codified, we coded um, and counted, literally counted, all the references to women, girls and gender and sexual violence in all the peace, those peace agreements, those 2000 peace agreements. We coded lots of other things as well, but this is just the data for that. 
And what you see here is um, the total number of agreements and the number that have any reference to women, girls and gender. And what I would say is this data completely overrepresents the picture of inclusion of women, girls and gender, even though, as you can see, the blue lines are only a fraction of the red ones. And that's because we, um, even agreements that have just one passing reference to women are included in this. And there's really only a handful of about 20 agreements um, in the whole bundle that really comp in any sort of holistic way deal with women's agendas for change and inclusion of women and the issues that really affect their lives. So in CIS you can see here also some interesting patterns that um, in ceasefire agreements, um, references to women are really, really small. And that's partly the subject matter that it's about trying to get the armed groups to stop fighting. Um, but it's also a problem, as I'll come to later. You can see that um, in ways the best progress is around the, co the comprehensive agreements, where comprehensive frameworks are agreements that tend to have more references to women. But interestingly, often, uh, for reasons I'll go into at the implementation stage, women drop out of the picture and the issues of concern to them drop out of the picture again. Um, so even though women have tried to influence processes, um, the ways in which agreements deal with women as a specific category and issues such as sexual violence is really very low. Uh, partly because of this, there's been a whole international move to try to in ways legislate and provide guidelines for including women and for addressing particular issues. Many of you will know about um, you, the, I just put a picture of the piece of Westphalia from 1648 here because I thought it's interesting sometimes how little has changed, but there's a big bunch of men ending conflict in Europe, supposedly, in 1648. But um, the norms now that exist are UN Security Council Resolution 1325, really foundational norm that set in place what's now known as the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, and there's been other norms building on it, uh, other resolutions building on it, including 2008. Um, partly with uh, the input and leadership of Hillary Clinton, um, UN Security Council resolutions focusing in particular on sexual violence. Uh, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women um, made a special recommendation as to how the, the Convention for Women should apply in situations of conflict and peace processes in 2013. And the UN DPPA has produced gender and mediation guidelines that try to support mediators to address issues of gender in negotiations. So there's now a sort of um, legislative and guide, soft and hard law guide apparatus um, saying how women should be included and how issues of gender should be dealt with. Um, but it still um, remains um, difficult. Uh, it's worth noting those norms actually have had some effect. I've just given here um, the overall agreements as a graph, the provisions in green on gender and the sexual violence ones. And you can see just loosely um, some sort of rise, uh, rise of um, measures dealing with women and sexual violence, which I think do seem to increase a bit more after the passing of the resolutions. Um, so the norms do have some effect, but obviously, um, they've not had a massive effect. And um, what we've seen is that they've probably had an effect mostly around comprehensive agreements, but not through the duration of the process. And why is it so difficult for women to get access to talks and to be have their sort of agendas heard? Firstly, I think those waging the conflict are seen as central to resolution of the conflict. The negotiations process focuses really on their concerns and justice issues are seen as secondary or only instrumental to stopping the war. And I suppose the last more controversial thing to say is what women want from peace processes and who can represent them is very complicated. Women don't have a unitary view any more than men do. They're represented across all the sides of the conflict. Um, and the idea that there's a simple sort of set of women's demands from a peace process is, of course, um, it, it doesn't work that way. And I thought I would give just an example at the different stages of the process um, about how um, 
about how the how this plays out, um, why each stage of the process constructs um, women as not women's uh, concerns as not central, um, and therefore feels it's okay to exclude the voice of women. So the first is I thought just this picture is a little bit interesting. This is actually um, a picture from 2015, and um, it's a picture that was taken several days after the um, the debate in the General Assembly and the debate, sorry, the debate at the UN Security Council resolution over the 15-year review of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. And that debate broke all records. More, the debate went on longer than any other debate. More people spoke, and there was great rhetoric from the most surprising of states around the inclusion of women. States were sort of almost knocking each other off down to talk about the importance of the inclusion women of women. This photo was actually one of the diplomatic meetings in the Syrian conflict, and I think if you look carefully. There is one woman at the back of the room, but just the sort of irony and ways of the contrast between the, the photo and between the rhetoric um, was really stark. So talks about talks are what we often think of as the pre-negotiation stage of a conflict. Um, and they often revolve around who's going to come to the negotiating table, what status are they going to come with? And what are they going to, what's the agenda for the talks that's going to be set there? Uh, these are really difficult for women to access because they really revolve around often back, back channel talks between armed groups to explore the possibilities of any compromise. Um, so often wider civil society won't know about the talks until they become public, and often publicity is the death of them in early stages. So there is reasons for these talks being secret. So they're inaccessible often to women unless women are represented at high levels in armed groups, um, which is quite a rare thing. Uh, however, they're crucial to who gets to the talks um, because often how the talks are designed come out of these types of early stage process. These talks are also crucial to framing the issues that will be discussed in the main agenda of the talks. So you will often hear mediators even now say, well, I'm just going to get a ceasefire and then we'll have these more inclusive talks and everybody will come. But of course, armed groups don't play their biggest card without getting something back and without knowing the shape of the political talks to come. So very few mediators just get a ceasefire with nothing else being designed. Um, it's, uh, the, often the agenda is set and a pathway dependency is created that has already sidelined many of the things that women might think it's important to talk about. Um, so, for example, uh, where the ceasefire is agreed, um, what is listed as a ceasefire violation can be hugely important to women. For example, whether sexual violence is listed as a ceasefire violation. Um, or whether civilian protection um, or recruitment of child soldiers is listed as a ceasefire violation um, can be really um, intrinsic to the experience of women from then on. Uh, if it's not list, if something isn't listed as a ceasefire violation, it won't be in the mandate for the people that monitor the ceasefire, and it, it won't be being monitored and it won't be being picked up. So even something as simple as the list of, of violations. Um, have a gendered dimension, even more so the agenda for talks and whether those contain the social justice dimension um, or an equality dimension uh, can often be determinative of the shape of the talks to come, or else people have to find ways to prise them open and revisit the agenda. Looking then at the negotiations um, around uh, reaching an end to the conflict, and I'm, I'm talking in very broad brush terms here. But it's important to understand that these are often attempts to end violence, um, but really to translate the conflict into political and legal institutions so that it could can be continued more peacefully. 
Now that's maybe a slightly strange way to put the enterprise of ending conflict. Um, but uh, I often used to have people ring me up actually and say, you shouldn't have the date and peace agreement in your database. It's not really a peace agreement. Um, because all it did was sort of take the war and turn it into a set of institutional arrangements. And I often want to write back and say, but they're all like that. They are all like that. Um, so often, uh, really, it's a move from violence that translates the conflict into political and legal institutions. Um, and that's not a totally bad thing because politics, nonviolent politics, is better than um, the politics of force and violence. But often this is done through a set of standard moves, most notably um, power sharing, bringing all the armed groups and all the different key groups into a joint form of government with a mandatory coalition government, a really difficult thing to run because it has people that have diametrically opposed views. Um, so I always think, you know, in the States, you see this a little bit in the separation of powers and um, the weighting of the Congress, the President, the Senate. But actually, if, if you imagine if you had everybody in, in one institution having to agree how to um, govern with a, each, each party holding a different ministry. Uh, and this is, we call it power sharing, but it's often really power splitting, where really government is sliced and diced into different components. So you have institutions that on the surface look normal, a legislature, a cabinet, but when you peer inside, have forms of very complicated power sharing. This is coupled then with institutional reform, changing police and army, trying to sort of civilianize the policing function, um, put in place a human rights framework, often a bill of rights uh, or, or some other human rights framework, um, dealing with the past, providing some measure um, of accountability or for reconciliation. Uh, and interestingly, actually, in this, it was one thing where our enterprise of coding all the agreements was really surprising um, because you read a lot about transitional justice, but the most fundamental demand that people have of the past initially is often um, tell us where our dead are, tell us where, um, you know, bring back the bodies, um, name the missing people, tell us where people are. That's almost the, the beginning of people's move into justice claims. And also agreements tend to then provide for implementation mechanisms. And in my work, along with colleagues, we have talked about the, these arrangements not really creating a, political, a new political settlement, but a form of political unsettlement, continued unsettlement, because all of these um, mechanisms really require to be worked out over time. So a lot of conflicts resolved by leaving radical disagreement over the nature, territory and ethos on the state unsettled and unresolved and telling people that they still have a chance to have their vision of the country prevail. At the implementation stage, um, sorry, I suppose I should say just, I'll go back to this slide. Um, the problem for women, I think, of these mechanisms are that often the power sharing controls what else happens. And that power sharing is often um, a power sharing across identity and political claims. And sometimes there is provision for women, uh, for set aside seats for women um, or some sort of uh, inclusion of women. But by and large, it sets up um, the main divisions that are at the heart of the conflict as being brought into joint government. And that then often constrains what's possible after that and makes it really difficult. Um, women are often involved um, through implementation mechanisms and through mechanisms for establishing institutional reform, which has to be viewed as a form of ongoing mediation and negotiation. At the implementation stage, um, the job is really trying to keep the parties to the commitments. Most parties enter a peace process experimentally to see if they can get more at the negotiating table than they can on the battlefield. 
and they often keep a route back open back to the battlefield. Um, so keeping parties to their commitments is very hard. When we had the agreement, we were really pleased with the agreement, and those of us in the women's community and the human rights community felt we had got a lot of things we wanted into the agreement, and we really felt that was the end of the process. And of course, what we found was that was the beginning of the process. That actually, even down to tra the, tra the job of translating the agreement into a piece of legislation, lots of people tried to write the agreement out of the legislation, and it was a big battle um, in in the um, Houses of Parliament trying to hold on to the agreement and make sure the commitments were kept. And actually, a woman played a key role in that. Mo Molam, who'd been the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, um, who had a lot of pressures on her to renege on the agreement. If you could persuade her that it was not the agreement that was being put into legislation, she really weighed in to keep the agreement, um, the legislation true to the agreement. Um, but there's often a need also to include new actors and new agendas, people that didn't come within the frame of the agreement, or armed groups who maybe felt that violence pays and grew up in the aftermath of the agreement. Um, often have to be brought in in an agreement that needs widened over time. Again, Northern Ireland's a good example of this. Um, the What was then the second Unionist Party, the Democratic Unionist Party, which over time became the biggest Unionist Party, had not actually signed the agreement, and a second agreement needs signed to try to bring them on board. Uh, there's also a job of undertaking the reform processes the partly the agreement operates as a form of contract, but partly it operates as an agenda for change and a roadmap to reform of issues like fundamental issues like policing and the role of the army. And there's a particular problem actually um, in countries that have periodic elections, which is that often compromise is unpopular and it's easier to oppose compromise and support it. Um, it's much easier to criticise compromise and take stark positions with relation to it. And therefore, periodic re um, elections often see changeovers in the government um, and a move from a pro-agreement stance to an anti-agreement stance that has to be managed as part of the implementation phase. And I suppose um, this is where I think um, the argument around women's involvement in particular comes in. Because while the agreement um, there are many ways in which we can argue for the inclusion of women. We can argue that it's just a good and right thing to do, and um, that women should be included regardless of their political positions, that they should be included as members of the delegations of all the parties, and they should be included in their own right, um, and that uh, women's agendas for change should be listened to alongside those of armed actors to conflict. Um, however, one of the very pragmatic arguments for inclusion of women in civil society is that while keep getting the armed actors on board start, can start a peace process, that peace process needs momentum. And when the, arm, when the groups in government hit bumps in the road, it often takes the wider sort of glue of civil society and the innovation and creativity of civil society to help the agreement over the bumps in the road. Um, and to carry it through. And if there isn't a wide and deep ownership of the agreement, then the agreement will break down because every agreement will hit a bump in the road, at least one and usually many. Now, I wanted to just talk about what's changing at the minute. And this was reflected in our, um, our uh, the title of our programme. But I, in my view, this whole process is sort of standing at a bit of a crossroads. And while many of us up until three years ago were arguing for better forms of inclusion, um, there was a building of a practice of how to better include women. Um, what There was an experimentation, for example, in Syria with the Women's Advisory Board, um, trying to find new creative mechanisms to bring women into the heart of negotiations processes. Um, we're in a really changed context in which it's getting harder and harder to mount peace processes at all. Um, 
many of the conflicts in the most protracted situations, Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, Sudan, um, uh, involve really not one conflict, but fragmented conflict that operates now as a system of local conflict, national conflict, transnational and geopolitical conflict, all bound up in very complicated ways. And it's very hard to think of the process design that brings all those interests in to be negotiated at once. On top of that, while there was maybe a very fragile global consensus, there, there was a practice of mediation. The AU developed its capacities, regional organizations, along with the UN. Um, but now um, asserting oneself to be a mediator in conflict is a way of asserting a particular vision of the geopolitical order. So the mediation space itself is both competitive and overlayered and much more fragmented with actors that adhere to international norms and actors um, that don't, and very different concepts of the peace being pursued. Uh, so I suppose one of the questions is really um, how, you know, we're trying to have a conversation about doing better than before in women, but we're in a situation where it's quite hard to hold on to the peace process practice at all. And, uh, and that has, of course, big repercussions uh, for, for all of us globally, really, but for women in conflict contexts in particular. So I want to just finish a little bit by throwing out just maybe some questions rather than um, come to a nice conclusion on this practice. It's been a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, but often there's arguments made that a process somehow is just better if women are involved. And of course, I believe that on some level. Um, but it's, is it enough to really say, well, you just add women and stir and that's OK. That's going to make the process better. Um, or do we need maybe better arguments for inclusion, in particular arguments that might persuade um, actors that are not do not have good equality practices within their own state who are now mediators? So, for example, um, Saudi Arabia had a key mediation role in Sudan, um, but its own practices um, on equality of women um, have a lot of issues. Uh, so will it, can we really expect Saudi Arabia to promote the equality of women in how it mediates um, a, a conflict in Sudan? Or what are the arguments for why um, a, a, it might want to it might want to do that. And I think those arguments are around the quality of the process and what it takes to sustain a process over time. Um, we probably do need better process design for multiple forms of inclusion, uh, for inclusion of women, non-dominant minorities, um, and many of the marginalized groups whose voice is sort of disproportionately excluded from peace negotiations. And I think um, although controversial, I would sort of ask you, do we need to balance standard setting and sort of standards that say women just need to be there, their issues need to be addressed with understanding of how you actually get those issues addressed when fashioning a deal? What are the arguments that people make? Um, what are the arguments that have traction? And how can you persuade groups to widen the agenda? to the types of social justice issues. And those often are about appeals to constituency and appeals to civicness. And how can we help women and others, sorry, I've moved on too fast, better understand and grapple with the implementation period of formalized political unsettlement, which is really a situation in which many of the dynamics of conflict are translated into the political institutions. And I suppose maybe I would add to that what are we to do with all of this in a world where um, the world is actually um, becoming in many, many different ways, both within conflict societies and societies that we think of as peaceful, but of course have many forms of violence. Um, what, what do we do with the broader polarization and the lack of capacity that our own constitutional structures have to create peace anymore? because this seems to me quite a fundamental 
question that we're having to grapple with across all societies and um, the situ situation um, of violence as a social condition. Uh, I'm just going to end. There's some resources there from the Peace Rep program where we have lots of research going on. Um, we couple the type of data that I've showed you, which gives global perspective and peace process, with um, research teams in many of these countries of people from the country providing more um, everyday peace accounts of how conflict unfolds. Um, and one of the things that you might want to look up that gives you a quick sense of what women get into agreements is the Peace Fem app, which is on Google Play and iStore that we produced with a number of research organisations and UN Women, um, which just gives some of the best examples of, pro of provisions um, for equality of women. Uh, and the idea was to help um, women mediators to sort of in a, in a context of mediation and the app actually is, was, is bilingual. It's actually multilingual now in um, several different languages, including Arabic. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and just open up to questions. Thank you.